Hi, welcome to Unplanned, the show about cities and how they work. Today we're joined with, by Sunil Paul, uh, a great entrepreneur, a great friend, and somebody who's made a lot of difference in this world. Sunil is a wonderful guy. He's talking to us today from San Francisco, California, and we're going to learn about one of his ventures, uh, Sidecar, which was literally the first ride-sharing app and service that ever existed. Uh, we're also going to find out what he's up to these days, and we're going to get some of his perspective on this crazy world of COVID that we've been going through. I want to remind you to subscribe to Unplanned, uh, but without further ado, let me welcome Sunil, and Sunil, thank you for joining us on Unplanned today. Hey, Sam. How are you? How have you been? I've been doing great. You know, the whole COVID situation is, uh, is challenging for all of us. I've got uh, high school seniors and they're having to deal with all of the, you know, disappointment of no prom and no face-to-face -face graduation. Uh, but, you know, otherwise we're, we're pretty fortunate. Um, and, you know, it's, it's definitely much harder for, for most people. Uh, how they just on, on those uh, high school seniors did they they made it through their graduation? How are they doing that these days? I know there are a lot of news stories about that. Is is it all virtual? Is that is that what's happening these days? Yeah, I'd say um, it kind of depends. Uh, it's two different schools, and one is is going to be all virtual with you know recorded little segments. The other one, um, the recorded segments. Uh, one of the recordings was done at the school. It's one of the other things that I'm quite interested in these days is how do you build a sense of connection and belonging and sense of experience, like a, a valuable experience uh, when it's all remote, when it's all digital? Um, it's not easy. Let's get, in, let's get into all that. But uh, first, I want to take you back in time. Uh, you and I, as it turns out, have known each other for, for as you say, for just about forever. Uh, and we've... Uh, We've been through a lot, we've seen a lot, uh, we've done a lot and uh, had some great times. In the 90s, uh, and tell me, correct me if I'm wrong about that, you started a transportation company, but I think I'm going back too far, is that correct? Yeah, the transportation things happened later. Uh, 1998, you're thinking of Brightmail, which is uh, the first uh, commercial anti-spam company, email security company, and um, yeah, it started it in the late 90s. Okay, so that's what you did in the 90s. I want to focus on the transportation stuff, uh, partly because of its impact on cities and what it means there. Uh, tell us a little bit of the story about uh, this company you started, which, as you say, is the first uh, transportation network company along the lines of w the ones that exist now, Uber and Lyft. Uh, but you were the first one out of, out of the gate. Uh, tell yeah. us about it. What, what was it? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I've been interested and fascinated by this question of how could we better use technology uh, to create more efficient transportation networks. And um, actually in the late 90s, I first kind of conceptualized this, um, filed for a patent and, and was awarded it in 2001. Um, and, but it wasn't until uh, 2011 that I teamed up with uh, co-founders, um, including Jahan Khanna, um, to, to really go tackle this question. Uh, and out of that effort came Sidecar, the first ride-sharing company. And, you know, we were the first ones to realize that you could use smartphones to, and background checks, electronic background checks, and uh, new kinds of insurance tracking, GPS tracking, to create uh, a service where anybody could uh, make money using their car by giving rides. And that, that was the beginning of what we might call the sharing economy. It's also what some people would call it the gig economy that we're, we're probably still in the middle of now. Yep. Um, how would you uh, evaluate uh, that impact? Because it obviously had a huge, profound impact on how people work and how people think about uh, what work is and also something like their own car, their own automobile, what they can you know, do with that. Yeah. Um, you probably have had a lot of thoughts about that. Curious. Yeah, about I, I think there are many layers to it. I think the part that tends to get the most attention right now, this kind of gig work uh, notion, uh, it is an important piece of it. But I would also say that if you look at the, even though 
uh, ride sharing and uh, delivery and all the rest have created a huge number of kind of mostly part-time, but also some full-time jobs. It's pretty minor compared to the contract work being done, it was already being done. Um, it turns out nurses are one of the largest and, and other healthcare workers are one of the largest pools of, of part-time kind of gig work. And uh, so it's, it's high profile because everyone experiences it. You don't experience nursing on a daily basis, but uh, you definitely del you know, experience delivery and, and ride sharing on a daily basis. It has kind of attracted all the attention. Uh, I think there are other things that are even more profound than, than just the impact on employment. Um, well, let's, let's get into those. I, I, I just want to stay on unemployment for one second more, though, because one of the uh, big challenges we're facing now is this, uh, what we might most broadly call the equity issue. You know, the people yeah. who can afford to work from home and those who have to get in their car and drive around to, to make uh, some money during the day. Uh, this whole transition with the smartphone and the app and the ability to sort of outsource myself as a commodity on the market, on the one hand, has been very freeing, but on the other hand, uh, on, in some other aspects, has been very challenging for a lot of people, as we've yeah. seen. Yeah. Well, I think um, the important yeah. uh, insight on it is that in many ways, that entire world uh, is made possible by a better social safety net. Uh, I think without Obamacare, it would have been uh, almost impossible to launch uh, Sidecar and all the and Uber and Lyft. Um, like you really do need some kind of uh, healthcare, and if you don't have it through your employer, uh, you're kind of screwed in our society. So um, Obamacare was very important in like laying some foundation. I think we need more of that social safety net. And like your, your retirement should not be tied to your employer. I mean, that is thinking that's derived from the idea that your employer is gonna be employer for life. Like that hasn't existed in decades, but our system is still built on that idea. Um, healthcare shouldn't be tied to employment. Like really all of these things that are about you as and you being able to take care of your physical your financial and your psychic well-being should not be tied to your employer. These changes in transportation will, uh, and not just ride-sharing, but ride-sharing is kind of the, the, the tip of what's happening right now. It's, it's already made cities far more livable than they were before. Right. Uh, it's made particular neighborhoods more livable. I think as we continue down this transition, especially with more and more autonomy in, in vehicles. Um, it will make, it'll make it more desirable, desirable to live in, uh, in, in dense urban environments. And it will make, it will kind of unlock the fact that there are, there's cheap real estate further away. Um, and it's gonna make those very far away places more attractive as well. Um, I think we're gonna, let sidecar and transportation and travel and automobiles uh, rest there. But I'm, I'm curious, uh, you're always up to something. You've always got some project or some plan or something you're working on uh, be, beyond getting uh, kids graduated from high school. Um, and uh, curious what you're, what you're up to these days. What are, you, what are you doing these days? Yeah, well, as you say, my, my kids are kind of my top priority right now, but um, um, well, let's see, there's a couple things. One actually relates to transportation again. I have been um, uh, pushing forward an idea that um, I've also I've had it in my head for a long time, but now I'm kind of pushing it forward. Uh, the idea is how do we accelerate the sale of electric vehicles? And uh, have the you, insight- Have you, yes, what's the, ins what's the insight? The insight is that electric vehicles cost more than a gas powered car up front but they don't cost very much to operate because they run on electricity and there's very little maintenance. So there's a important innovation that was applied to solar called a power purchase agreement. We're doing something in electric vehicles called a mileage purchase agreement. It basically buys down the cost of, you know, gives consumers uh, the ability to get an electric vehicle for uh, perhaps as little as zero, uh, up front, and 
they pay it back through savings in uh, gas and maintenance. So ran a contest on this uh, called Spring Free EV. I can go to springfreeev.com and, and see some of the detail on that. Had over a dozen teams um, compete to try to figure this out. Have you announced the winner? The winners have been announced? Yeah, uh, the top winner is a company called Flux EV. That's great. I'm going to share with you a, a local nonprofit. I think it's a nonprofit here in Massachusetts it's called the uh, Green Energy Consumers Alliance. Okay. They help uh, people get uh, electric vehicles uh, through a, I think they do it through a negotiation with the dealerships. And it's, so you get additional markdowns on top of the federal tax credit and on top of a state rebate that's also available here in Massachusetts. Uh, but they're a great organization and they've been at it now for a couple of years, for two or three at least years. Um, and it just is a further markdown on the cost of the vehicle, basically. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'd love to learn more about them. Uh, just in closing, um, I'm curious what your kind of broad, broadest observations are about what we've just been through. Uh, that, well, we're still going through this whole COVID experience and what it's meant. Uh, both to you as a professional person thinking about the world and your sort of idea creation, but also on a personal level, uh, what, what are some of the observations you've made? About yeah, you? I mean, this is a tremendously profound moment for, I mean, really everyone. Um, and it's really, it's caused a bunch of acceleration of things, uh, caused us to question the sort of structure of how things, of society really. Um, but I, I often think about, wow, this is, this is the biggest change in lifestyle uh, collectively for humanity ever. Like in our history, we've never had such a big change. Uh, and never before in the history of humanity have so many kids wanted to go back to school. <laughs> and their parents, by the way. Yeah, it's, um, I, I do think it's gonna change things. I mean, it's obviously already changed things around well, concerns around the safety of, of the sharing economy. Uh, many of those will persist, but I think we'll, they'll be overcome over the long term. Um, and concerns about being in cities. Again, I don't think 10 years from now, people are gonna be like, oh my God, I don't wanna go to a restaurant. Um, but I think things like telework and learning remotely, uh, all of that's gonna be fundamentally impacted. I think universities, Mm, at least most of them, I think, are in deep trouble because you mean, you mean financially? Popped, you, I think. Wait, wait, in what sense? I, I've been quite fascinated by this whole transition to the telework, telelearning. And you think, what does a university offer? Well, one of the things it offers is you come to our campus, you come to our environment, and we not only we not only educate you, but we give you a whole set of experiences. And now, as you say, the whole world has learned how to do a lot on Zoom and other platforms, et cetera. What, what, do you, what, what do you take away from the university uh, environment? Well, uh, university has been sold as this ticket to the middle class. And, and it's incredibly expensive. You got all these people going into you know, pretty significant debt to, to be able to get that ticket. And, like, what, and, and meanwhile, because of the dynamics of the sales process, of convincing someone to go to that university, universities end up investing in things like great landscaping, right, which does a zero for actually giving you anything that that can you know result in in right. having a better right. life. Right. So uh, so now what's happening is universities are like, oh well, okay, let's not worry about landscaping for a while. We're gonna we're gonna make our classes smaller, more modularized. We're gonna have them all available online. Um, you know, that's going to have the effect of certain professors uh, are going to be able to teach 2000s from the video perspective, and there'll still be a need to interact. Some of that can be done online, and some of it will need to be face to face, but does it need to be on a particular campus? Not all the time. Maybe you only need to come together on a campus once a month or a couple of times a year. Yeah. I, and, and not that. Look, a university experience, the traditional university experience, obviously is incredibly valuable. But is it worth $60,000 a year, right? Because whether it's a public or a private university, there is an actual cost to doing it. Um, 
No, I don't think so. And uh, what's funny, what's funny slash interesting about that is that, of course, the university is one of the oldest corporate models that exists. I mean, it goes back thousands of years in some forms. And uh, so rethinking it now in the digital age is an interesting. But it is kind of a Anglo-American hmm. tradition. Hmm. Right. As I, I don't fully understand the dynamics of, of, of say, the German system, but there is not quite the same, um, as I understand it, there's not quite the same hang up around, oh, you have to have a certain kind of university education in order to have a solid uh, kind of financial uh, and also social status life. You know, I think we need a clear path that if you just want to, first of all, school should be free all the way through, I think, kind of the, the equivalent of an associate's degree. And if you want to kind of use that to build up enough skills to have a, a solid life, that should be not only a path to a solid life, but it should be, like, that should be a respectable status of, of being part of society. And uh, the idea that you need a bachelor's degree to, to get ahead in life or to be successful is, is ridiculous, really. Like there's no, there's no fundamental thing that, that is transferred um, by, by getting a bachelor's degree. I'm gonna give you one last random one, completely random one. Okay. I, I, I have asked you this before, uh, but I'm curious your thoughts, um, partly on the electric vehicle side. What's going on with Elon Musk? That guy is a bizarre <laughs> character. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, look, I, I, I have a, uh, a respect, disgust kind of relationship <laughs> with thinking about him. There's, a, there's a bit of love and a bit of hate. Yeah. <laughs> strange character, though. I mean, what the hell? I, so, yeah. I mean, look, a lot of respect for he has transformed electric vehicles, hmm. accelerated that world by perhaps decades compared to what might have happened otherwise. And same with space and doing things that perhaps nobody else would, would dare to do. So, okay, great, all respects. And what, like, are you, like, what's going on in your brain about, about the transmission of, of this disease that like you cannot understand now? I am suspicious and part of what I think incenses me and so many other people is that like, okay, right, your stock price, your own personal bonus plan is highly tied to production levels. Interesting. And so, yeah. yeah, okay, but like basically what you're saying is you're blinded to right. and, and, and kind of rationalizing a thing that's gonna result not only in the illness and death of your own employees, but the broader community. Right. No, it just seems so irresponsible on so many levels and so uh, just kind of missing the point. I mean, for a guy who seemed to be so focused on making the world a better place, he seems now to be very focused on not helping out at a time of communal crisis. It's, it's just strange. Yeah. Well, anyway, before we go too far down that road, let me just say, let me just say once again, thank you, Sunil, for joining us. On, on a lot of fun, Sam. I, yeah. I love what you're doing with this uh, with this video cast podcast thing, and I'm uh, I'm happy to be here.